Dana, da, Dana, da, Dana. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery here for round two. Oh my gosh, this is like the second podcast in a row we've done round two. You better <laughs> dig into that monster, buddy. Oh man, we brought, well I bought two, so yeah, I got two for you, two for me, and we're ready to go for another great episode. We're back in the studio, we're back from TakeOver, and nothing slowed down. Nothing, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were just telling me how bored you are and you got nothing to do, just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. Oh Jesus, I'm so buried in work, I can't even believe where I'm at, I'm so behind on some yeah, I, I owe a lot of people some content, and I have not done it, and I apologize. I hope they're listening so they can hear me genuinely say I'm sorry for not getting it out yet. Yeah, my uh, my cars are good. My trailer's good. My house is a mess. Like uh, <laughs> So is my Yeah, my, my wife's kitchen is legitimately just an assortment of off-road products. And, uh, I could see that happening. Parts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, dude, I, uh, last night I slept in a Pro Eagle blanket. Yeah. Wow. It was a little heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get one of those? I want to order a Pro Eagle blanket. I'll, I'll make a call. <laughs> uh, you, speaking of Pro Eagle, you just got a brand new uh, jack in. I mean, we have uh, the CO2, the original CO2 jack. I've got three of those, and I got the big guy. Uh, the big guy is still, I, I got to assemble it today. but Because uh, it just came out. Yeah, it's the one that you strap into the back of your pickup and all that good stuff, which you, you haven't seen my gooseneck yet. Oh, you're They're, talking about the actual shop jack. I'm talking about the new version of the CO2 jack. New version of that? No, I do not have that. I have three of the Phoenix. Okay, so you did yeah. just get a third one. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I'm going to order up the new one. The, the new one looks bitching, for sure. So the new one looks like it's a little bit thicker. It has a third sleeve, basically, allowing it to go one more segment higher. Yeah, but also looks like it starts a little lower. That's that's oh I didn't even too, think about so, that yeah. yeah so it probably gets a little yeah. lower for the lower clearance stuff um, maybe some of those trucks or whatever yeah. but so that'll look that'll be cool we'll have to check that out maybe we maybe we grab both of them and put them in comparison or whatever you know I like toys <laughs> so uh, yeah bu- busy last few weeks uh, we did take over Oregon how was just a summary of your experience at, at Oregon so when we left the idaho bdr there was a collection of dudes in my truck and we were staring off into the mountains and one of them made this comment he goes if i even see another mountain i'm gonna riot it's kind of the same way like when who you, doesn't <laughs> like mountains come hey, on man we all like mountains but when you've gotten your butt kicked by them for like eight <laughs> days straight sand can be that way a little bit too and like when we left we left uh, we left pretty late on sunday or saturday night and we'd pulled an all-nighter to drive home dude this i am like i don't know what's going on is, is that it, recording is it recording Oh, it is recording. Okay, sorry, that was my mistake. Total derail. Where was Anyways, it? We, mountains. We were, we were talking about. <laughs> we were talking about the blockage in the Suez Canal. So, uh, I had a blockage last yeah. night. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we got out of there super late and uh, pulled an all nighter to get home. And I think we got home at like eight the next morning or something like you that. You guys left Saturday night, right? Yeah, we left about ten. It was uh, it was a long night. We actually stopped at a rest area to grab a nap, but it was uh, that was a that, that event is just nonstop. And I tell people it's like you're on site at eight o'clock in the morning, and the earliest I went to bed was about twelve thirty at night. Uh-huh. Yeah, I averaged uh, getting to my trailer around one. Yeah, and uh, doing a bunch of editing because the internet didn't even work until around one. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like you're out there just partying it up and stuff. You're mm-hmm. just you're networking and you're meeting people and you're shaking hands and you know, uh, buggy whip was right next to us. So the booth, Russell came on yeah. came on up and had his first experience exactly. at takeover. So that booth is lit up all night. So we're the only people on <laughs> quite literally lit quite up. Literally. <laughs> yeah, so we're the only booth that's open after the sun goes down and i mean and we're out there shaking hands and stuff talking to people as late as 12 30 because people come off the night ride and they're just absolutely euphoric they're stoked and what do they do they go right down into the vendor area to go hang out to go to rock and roll bingo to go do stuff and we're still at the booth so it just translates to a lot of a lot of faces we get to see how was the night ride? Did you get to go on one? I went on one, yeah. Yeah, it was epic. For so sure. the, the Wednesday night night ride was about four to 500 cars. Yeah. And then like Thursday was about six to 700 cars. Yeah, I did Thursday and Friday, I think. Yeah, and then Friday that. was roughly 800-ish cars, 900, maybe even 1,000 cars. I, we're estimating between eight to 1,000 cars, somewhere yeah. in there. And uh, and then Saturday, I didn't, I, met, I didn't see that one, so I didn't know exactly how that went. So when we were headed back towards Boxcar on the night ride, I was with Russell, uh, Ken Dunnigan, 
uh, Kyle from Dune and Destroy. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was out there. But we ran into, I, I spotted a couple of buddies of mine on the dunes that were watching the night ride. So as soon as we got done, I flipped the 180, rallied everybody up, and we went back to go find them. Well, we never found them. So as many people are on the dunes after the night ride, I told the guys, it's like, all right, we're going to rip through the trees because nobody's going to be, be in there. And we went on a freaking night ride. Hell. <laughs> <laughs> it was badass. Yeah, we had a great time, man. Just So we've talked there. before about the, the trees and the moguls and all that stuff out of the dunes. Like at night, that's the time to ride them because you can see people coming. You can see them coming. Yeah. And during the day, you have no clue. And there's a lot of wrecks during the day because people come flying around the corner, no comprehension of anyone being there and, and take out the front end of another car. And if you have the most light on the sand, you will still see people. You're not going to drown them out. You'll still see people coming. It's a much, much safer time in my opinion, to go aggressively ride those trails. If you're comfortable with the dune, dunes and the trails and how that all works, because there's a lot of times and where light you, you have, because a lot of times you'll go over a, a berm or something and then drop 10 feet. And, yeah. and if you're not aware of that situation, you could just assume it's going to be another corner sure. and, and, and take the car over. A, and, and bear in mind, I'm out there leading guys on trails that I know. So, I mean, there's definitely some, that's always nice about being second, sure. third or fourth is that you, if the car goes over and you see him keep going, you, you know, yeah, you're pretty like safe. Pin it. pin it. If he and Rex will slow it down, it's <laughs> 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 so, uh, night rides were pretty epic. I, I edited a little video uh, recap of that, and it got well received. There's a lot of good uh, shots in there, and it's a uh, it, it was a good time. Oh, that um, night ride vid you did was killer. But here's the crazy thing: you and I are around each other quite a bit. We've been around each other more today than we were in the <laughs> five days at Takeover. Uh, yeah, that I was, would. That was pretty accurate. It was well, freaking busy. The, the podcast was the only time really that we saw each oh, other. Yeah, if you discount the podcast, that's a legit statement. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the you were so consumed with you know the, you taking care of your booth, your guys. The you had buggy whips show up and share your space. You had um, pro eagle, pro eagle sharing some space. You had stuff. You had you had more pro eagle inventory in your trailer than I've ever seen in one place at one time. Dude, I uh, I had uh, I think I was not going to say responsible for, but I probably made about six to seven introductions for people slash influencers that got them sponsorships from various component companies. And that gets me really stoked. Like when I introduce good people to good people and then they hit it off, dude, it's, it's the best. Yeah. It's just like, you know, the, 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 in, the interesting thing to me is that a lot of people discount big names that put out a lot of media because they just assume that it's because they have lots of money to throw at media and so that they just they bought their way in. Yeah, and we have no money. <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for that. Yeah, we um, we are guerrilla warfare when it comes to <laughs> off road media. <laughs> and the the interesting thing is you connect the people that actually make high quality products with people that actually can use high quality products, not just bolt it on it and show it off. And then all of a sudden they're just like a magnet together and, you know, bugs to a flame. Like they're just going to, they're going to hit it off. So yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, we, like I said, that's why you, that's why you're leaving the booth at one or two in the morning is because once you get chit chatting about certain people's needs, what certain, you know, it's just, it's a great environment, man. There's nothing like UTV takeover period so yeah yeah it was a great time and and so Oregon went off it was the biggest that Oregon ever uh biggest takeover ever uh largest turnout largest everything largest vendor row um biggest activities turnout for all the different little mini games stuff like that so it was really a, a great time and I asked a few of the different vendors uh down on vendor row you know like how they how they did and and whatnot like I talked to BJ and uh, from addiction I talked with uh, will from superior and I've talked to a number of different other people and they pretty much all had a consensus that they were up you know 30 to 50 percent in sales that over last year and last year was COVID year I think superior told me that they had eclipsed 2020 by Wednesday yeah, that was the big deal. Was yep. that like even Tuesday, people were asking, "Hey, where do we buy stuff?" Like, yeah. and we're, it wasn't even open. It was, yeah. <laughs> the, the show, show wasn't, wasn't even open yeah. yet. So yeah, uh, Wednesday, um, I think I mentioned on the podcast at the takeover, uh, like they basically sold out of their apparel like yeah. on Wednesday. So yeah, I mean, the craziest thing is, is it's really the only show that kind of combines. And there are other shows. Let me let me paraphrase that. 
it's but it's one of the biggest environment shows outside of Glamis where you can walk into Vendor Row and see a lot of the people that you would see at Sandsport, uh, see a lot of the manufacturers, see a lot of the people that are contributing to the industry. But then you can go cop in your side by side and go rip some of the best sand dunes in America. You know, you go to Sandsport, everyone's at Sandsport. You can't ride. You know, you right. can't go for a ride. You can't do anything. You can go to King of Hammers. King of Hammers, you can ride. There's a limited amount of people that are there vending. But By the not- time you go to Hammers and go ride, like that place is a dust bowl already. And it's not necessarily the most pleasurable experience unless you're fully pumped. Have you have pumper to system and all that stuff. And you have to love the you dirt. You have to love dirt. And the like, desert. Yeah, 100%. Like if dirt is your thing, if like dirt is your heroin, King of Hammers is your freaking, <laughs> is your drug dealer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, there's lots of events around the country. They all have their different uh, niches and reasons to go to them. Uh, and, you know, we like you're going to be going to Dunefest here uh, in the next week. And, and that's another another show like kind of like takeover <clears throat> where they do a lot of the similar things that takeover does um just a different environment a different kind of focus and and the consumer market that goes to it's a little bit different a lot more quads a lot yeah. more dirt bikes um <clears throat> things like that so it's a little bit different niche even though it's the same overlapping you know industry so when i arrive at dune fest it's going to be the four-year anniversary of when i met you and when I showed up at that Dune yeah, Fest, yeah. I, when I showed up at that Dune Fest, I was in an FJ Cruiser towing a just a crap utility trailer <laughs> in a brand new YXZ that was bone stock. Uh, I think I had, no, I didn't even have paddles on it. I was out there on Bighorns. So I show up to that and just network my butt off. I met, I met uh, Rugged Radio, ZRP, SSV, um, just kind of a who's who of... Uh, California based manufacturers that were contributing to what I was seeing as a massively ascending market. Four years later, I'm rolling into Dune Fest on a 43 foot gooseneck trailer with two <laughs> side by sides in the back, towing it with a freaking uh, yoked out lifted ram. So, off road's been very good to us. <laughs> yeah, it's it, I, I started doing the hashtag for the battery. I started do, uh, doing the hashtag the off road battery, you know. Because it's it's something that our entire company is just rallied behind and is starting to develop a passion for. So it's just it's killer. It's hard to hard to imagine. It's been four years, dude. Yeah, and you know, like with your story, getting into the market um, with the battery, people are just like, "What are you going to do with a battery?" Right? Like, but there's an actual need for it. Getting away from the flooded, getting into a sealed ecosystem, getting into a rugged casing, getting into a high you know amp hour setup uh, is exactly what the off road ne- industry needed, and and no one's. Really targeting it outside of like the high performance truck stuff right. where you're where you're talking about the optimas and the all that stuff but they're not really targeting our industry where it's the smaller lighter more nimble stuff their version of targeting that sort of stuff and i'm not trying to throw uh, cast dispersions or throw shade or anything like that but their their idea of, of being involved in that environment is sponsorship They'll sponsor an event, be a primary sponsor of an event, cut a big check, but never show up. Not only do we show up, I'll lead rides. I'll go out there. Where you're participating. It's not just a matter of putting a sign up somewhere. It's actually being a part of the community. Yep. I love it. And every every employee at the company loves it. I mean, if if I wasn't out there doing it, I've got three coworkers that would be doing it. So right. it's great. So, uh, yeah. So we're like we said, you're preparing to go to Dune Fest this weekend, right? Or no, next weekend. So yeah, you're leaving, leaving next leaving week. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm flying out. Probably Monday, right? Monday morning at 6 a.m. So yeah. I'm going to be taking off out of the house probably around 5. Where are you landing? Uh, so I'm going to. So I'm taking Spokane to Dallas and then I'm taking Dallas to Tri-Cities, Virginia. Um, so basically the lower west side of Virginia and then driving the other two hours or whatever to, uh, to west, Grundy. So, so you're close to North Carolina, Tennessee then where you're playing yeah. and then driving up. That's yeah. cool. It's right, it's right at the, uh, the intersection of those states did where you, they all come together. Did you rent a car? Uh, so they, they're renting a couple, few different cars. So um, you're, you're riding with people. Yeah. So I'll be meeting uh, Jim and all the Oregon crew that are flying out of Oregon to Dallas and then taking the same plane over to Grundy or to, to Virginia. And then we're going to be, we got a truck and an SUV and whatever, because we, none of us are going to have our UTVs there. So we have to have vehicles that we can kind of put around in and all that. You need to be able to get out of the truck and film some stuff. When you see what goes on, what, what Grundy's like and and the coal mines and stuff that are around there, it's incredible. I mean, you're going to be going right through Appalachia. You're going to be wheeling in Appalachia. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you want to talk about kind of Americana and a snapshot of kind of the old coal miner type 
um, culture you're going to have eyes on that. And it's really, really cool, man. It's, I'm it's super excited to be, be in the East coast Hills yeah. and, and all that. I mean, obviously we've seen pictures and, and all that stuff and you've been there before. Um, but I think they're, I think they're trying to organize a, like a group ride, like a, like a, all the staff together, like Tuesday night where we can go up into the Hills and experience some of that. Yep. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that. Um, not really looking forward to wearing someone else's helmet, but, uh, we'll, we'll take care of that when we get there. FedEx can take care of you. That place has got <laughs> an address but i'm sure somebody over there probably has a uh, a helmet i could buy or something well i'm interested to hear what your perspective is because as you get closer to grundy you're going to realize that there is no two-lane roads they may be two-lane roads they're not two-lane roads <laughs> they're not two-lane roads as we know them. they're about as wide as from me to you like <laughs> it is uh, like if semis and stuff they're like single go, tracks yeah you got to come to a dead stop and pull way off onto the non-existent shoulder <laughs> yeah it's it's a trip yeah, so it's going to be pretty crazy. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just buried in, in getting that media taken care of for that event. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot to do still. Um, and so the next couple of days for me are, are going to be late nights. I've yeah. been taking care of a lot of family stuff, so it's just limited my time to do stuff. And um, it's going to be pretty crazy. But you got Dune Fest coming up. If you are on the West Coast and you can't travel across the country to another event, uh, you might want to check that out. Uh, they got that starting on is that starting what, Thursday, Wednesday. Tuesday. Tuesday. So they're they're actually just kicking off oh, events yeah. Tuesday? Yeah, there'll be people out riding Tuesday. Well, sure. there's going to be people riding. but the, the vendors will be set up by then. Vendor rows on Tuesday? Yep. Okay, so yeah. then they go through Saturday? This is uh, uh, through Saturday, yeah. I, I'm leaving Saturday morning, but this is a, a show that I'm actually really looking forward to because I'm not direct presenting. I have four vendors there. Gotcha. Yeah, Superior's there, Addiction's there, Obsession's there, and Interstate Battery out of Eugene is there. And uh, they all stock stock our batteries. So I'm just going to be going from one booth to another, shaking hands, uh, handing out stickers, lanyards, having fun, meeting people, and uh, hopefully after about 5 o'clock go out and play around in the sand and in your state i just saw a social post it has challenged everybody to a, a bingo card contest to to win that so at winchester at at, at winchester yeah for a for a full throttle battery uh just just in general for the dealers that do interstate oh, cool. inter business and all that so you'll have to jump in on that and, oh, cool. and see if you can't win that thing and win my own battery that'd be sick well <laughs> <laughs> the uh they have uh one of the squares is something about a handlebar mustache so you'll have to start growing it out now dude yeah, I mean, this thing's going to be like Daniel Boone within about 48 hours, so <laughs> I'm going to look like Zach here if I don't <laughs> um, I don't know if you could look that ugly. I mean, it's pretty pretty grotesque, so. You, the funny thing is, we've talked about it, you have the most recognizable feature in Pacific <laughs> Northwest media, off-road media, for sure. That's definitely what people yeah. look at. They walk by and they just got that little weird look in their eye. And it's Six like, foot four, check. Red beard, <laughs> check. So, anyways, uh, so you're leaving Saturday, you said? And and then Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, leaving the event uh, Saturday, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because uh, the following Tuesday, I head to McCall for my little Chad Fest uh, <laughs> Idaho ride. Chad, Chad's guided ride. Uh, assuming that Idaho isn't on fire, but I've been That's watching. That's a big it. deal, right? Because Washington shut down all the public land, all the DNR land. You can't go ride it because they're f scared of fire danger. 12 um, months ago to the day, we were dealing with the same stuff. And right. then uh, right around the beginning of August, you know, there were still some sporadic fires that had been broken out, but by and large, they had it under control. So I got my fingers crossed that we're going to be able to pull this off. Everything's looking like we will. Uh, it could be a little smoky in some places, but, you know, I mean, is what it is. it's just the reality of the Northwest nowadays. If you don't like smoke, you're not going to wheel. Yeah. And, and Idaho is a little bit more lenient on how they handle that kind of process. They're more about, you know, taking care of things and then reacting when they need to versus just being panic mode and shutting everything down. And the other thing is, too, is Idaho has a better trail system system than washington does washington much is, better it's super <laughs> it's super ruddy it's super rocky uh washington's is super muddy super rocky super uh narrow idaho is like driving on i-5 on some of those you might as well be uh, in a sure. cadillac like they, i don't even call it wheeling like it's just sightseeing i mean we've know? seen a prius out there before yeah. so <laughs> well what's funny is like we're in this chat window where we're organizing this thing and everybody's a little bit concerned about the pace being a little bit too hot i'm like not only are there opportunities to do 35 out on some of these trails, but you're going to see straight lines and stuff where just go as fast as you're comfortable going. You know, it's it's wide. It's safe. Visibility's off the charts. You know, one just, of the most exciting parts of riding in Idaho is when you get that 
that side mountain trail that is just like a beeline for a mile and a half and you can see straight down it with maybe a slight curve and on the on your gps you can see it's pretty wide open yeah and then you see the little the rain management systems the little kickers and you can just floor it 50 60 miles an hour fly <laughs> off a little foot two foot kicker and, and land 15 feet away from where you started and, and, and have a, a good time out in the mountains yeah and i gotta tell you i ripped off uh i i ripped off a little page out of your playbook i um did you buy an iPad? I did. You just bought a GPS. I, I did. I did that too. <laughs> so you have two GPS. I, I have a tread for the uh, for the Pro, and I have an iPad for mine. Because my, oh. my Magellan my Magellan still works, but you can't see it. Like the screen's fried. And really, the screen yeah. went out. Yep. I mean, you can see it. It just has to be midnight for you to be able to see it. <laughs> like if there's any light at all, you won't see what it is. But the the uh, the iPad. I uh, I haven't ordered it yet. I was going to talk to you about this. Uh, so Zach Zach runs an iPad and his RZR with a little GPS booster on it, yep. and that's what I want to run for no other reason that uh, I, I got this TKO clamp while I was at Rally in the Pines. This iPad Mini, which an iPad Mini is about I don't know what's that about an eight inch nine inch screen somewhere in that ballpark. I think it's like seven nine or something. Uh, like so if you can visualize the steering wheel of an X3, this thing is right behind the dash. So you got the steering wheel right in front of your cluster, cluster. and and the uh, uh, the iPads right behind it. So that's gonna make that's gonna make me. So it sits behind the cluster. Yes, just okay. barely, gotcha. barely. Yeah, and uh, you know we tightened that thing down pretty good, and I I made sure and asked him. I'm like, so how does this thing like 70 mile an hour whoops? And they're like, oh, it should do okay. I'm just so, <laughs> should was the well, key word. In but that the thing sense. is, the, the thing is, though, is in situations where I'm going through 70 mile an hour whoops. Currently, I don't need a GPS because that means I'm riding in Moses Lake. That means I'm riding the sand dune, so I don't need a GPS. So I can actually pull that thing out. But you know, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I feel a lot. Wow, I just stuttered a lot there. I feel a lot better about this setup because our. our our theory is essentially two is ones, one's none. You know, we've talked about that forever and a day. This will be my third GPS that I'm running <laughs> at the same time in the X3. So I think I'm going to run Onyx on the iPad, the Magellan will run, and then my little <laughs> cell phone carrier will have Gaia up. I should be okay. <laughs> now, have you ordered the GPS module that I have? No, not yet. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. And so, and so that's that's the important look, dude, part. I'm, I'm worried about me. I'm worrying about. I'm worried about telling you that you're right too much. <laughs> so I, but the I thing, was I was working my way there. <laughs> so, so tell 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 the people that listen to the show why you use Gaia <laughs> or why you use an iPad. It's because it's on an online setup to where it's always expanding and you can always make you can. There's plugins, you know. Whereas you're using a dedicated unit, dedicated units come out every forty eight months 24 months whatever then you shell out 700 bucks for a new unit whereas the expansive the online stuff is subscription based 30 bucks a month bob's your uncle yeah so the the just so everyone if you haven't heard our previous episodes what i run is a is an ipad it can be any ipad it doesn't matter which one uh and then i run the gaia app on it with the forestry maps overlaid onto it with um, maybe a few different layers that i've maybe downloaded and saved into the program um and then i use a uh gps a dedicated gps unit that's made by dual which some people may have you know heard of like walmart or like a best buy radio brand or whatever but it, they actually have a separate it's a different brand that does avionic gps and so they have these this little module that a lot of guys in racing use uh in conjunction with uh the um lorance no what's the app um uh, the one that West used the the app. Oh, Lead Nav. Lead Nav. Yeah. They'll they'll use it in conjunction with that, and and the people that sell Lead Nav, they'll actually they sell an actual like dedicated hard metal mount for the GPS unit and all that. Um, but what it does is it's a it's a 10 hertz GPS that can refresh super fast, and it can connect up to five different devices at once and provide them GPS data. So you can have that unit provide GPS to your phone, your tablet whatever bluetooth the guy in the back seat if you have a four seater that's running his own thing whatever right. um and and that thing will update fast enough that you can drive full pace as fast as you want and it'll be completely accurate to where you're at and it won't have any lag so the question i have tech guru is with that device do you need an ipad that has a cellular plan no so what you do is you download all the maps and everything beforehand you take your route, you download the 
I don't know, one, two miles east and west of wherever you're at so that you have the entire system all the way through where you're planning on going. And, and what I do is I actually download the entire encompassing area. So like for Idaho, I had done like 20 miles east and west sure. all the way through sure. so that if we had to deviate some big, crazy route, we had that option. Right. Um, and then that takes up a lot of space, right? So you don't have a lot of apps and movies and music and stuff on your iPad. You dedicate it kind of to that purpose for that trip. <clears throat> and then you have all your layers, you have all that stuff. And, um, and then you can kind of move forward however you want. And then the nice thing about having, um, the iPad is it can, like I said, it'd be any iPad. It could be iPad mini. It could be a cellular pro. It could be whatever you want. It doesn't need internet yeah. if you've prepared ahead of time. And the reason I, the reason I said that is because the iPad on the cellular, people are going to equate that that they're going to get a bill on Verizon or get AT&T. Right. You, you're not getting a bill. The, the cellular ready iPads have the antenna in it for GPS right from the box. So that unit that you're talking about, that 10 Hertz one, um, that negates the need for that antenna? Is that what you're telling me? So if you have a cellular iPad, uh, you have a cellular radio. Yep. And when you have your iPhone or your iPad connected to the cellular network, Verizon, ATT, whatever, uh, they have what's called GPSA, which is GPS yep. assisted. And what that means is it's a fake GPS. It's and a you, GPS but you based don't off need your... a data plan to see where you're at. No, because what time. it does is it's taking the information from the cell phone because GPS yeah. works with satellites in the air in the in, up in the orbit that ping down and then it triangulates where you're at based off those three points or multiple points. Um, and when you have a cell phone tower in multiple cell phone towers, it can do basically the same thing. It can triangulate where it's at based off the cell phone towers. Uh, so it's kind of a fake GPS, but it operates the same way, but it's not a true DP GPS. So if you're in the hills and you're down in a valley or whatever, and you don't have cell phone signal to multiple towers, there's no way for it to triangulate where you're at. So having a dedicated GPS unit gives you that. As long as you can see the sky, you're good. You're good. And so on the iPad, you can run the app, the GPS app for that 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 unit, and it'll show you all the GPSs on, that it's connecting to. Right. And it'll show you the signal strength for all of them. And you can see like when you're out in the open, you'll have 26 GPS satellites all connected to your unit or I'm pinging off of it and giving you information. And then you'll dive down into a valley and you'll see it kind of shrink down to a list of, you know, 20 or 18 or four. If you're really deep, you can get down to a few. Uh, but I never once lost GPS signal anywhere we went. Right. Right. Yeah. Th this trip, we're going to have uh, 30 plus bodies and about 20 machines. Today. This trip in Idaho that yeah. we're going to be doing to after these events. Today's number is, is that, that that's pretty accurate. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully the dust isn't too bad. But if if we get a little wind, the man, dust is going to be insane. It's going to be <laughs> insane. But I mean, if we get a little wind, it should be manageable. You know, uh, the dust the dust definitely sucked uh, when we did the ID Idaho BDR for the guys that want to get up and battle. But if you're just or out just wanted to be within a mile and a half of the person in front of them, was it that bad? It there? was that bad. So wow. like I, I did multiple different spots. I was up at the front for a while. I was in the middle for a while. I was near the back for a while. And literally what happens is it could be windy, you know, halfway up the hill, up to the top of the hill, but down in the valley, it could be dead still. <clears throat> So um, there was times where you'd be shooting through a bunch of gravelly trail and have no problems and you could you'd, you would power into it and then I'd catch up to somebody like I'd be behind uh, our friend Rich a lot of the time and I'd catch up to him. Oh, we're talking Idaho. Yeah. 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 And Rich wasn't on Idaho or not Rich. Um, who was in front of me then? It must have been the um, Ben or the or um, Coop or somebody or Coop or somebody. Yeah. So I, I'd come up behind him and I'd be like, sweet, a cop to him. But then I would hit. Then we would hit a silty area, and instantly I'd be like, "All right, throw in park, get out, grab a drink, grab a snack, hang out for a while, five ten minutes until the dust dust settled, and yeah. then I'd get back into it." And that's why I was ripping when I was up front. Just get it over with. Uh, hold a hot pace. Get out of people's way. Everybody knows, knows where they're going. They heard the radio calls, and uh, but that's why we had to do radio bouncing because yeah, we, we were, were so we were, far yeah. apart because of dust that we were getting extended a mile, two miles between each other. Thus being 8, 10, 12 miles apart, yeah. and we had to do radio radio relays all the way through the mountains to get information from the front to the back. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, uh, it it's imperfect. It's imperfectly perfect, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking semi controlled chaos. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's it's something that people are starting to. I, I don't talk about it too much because the reason I uh, the reason I don't is the second I start talking about it, I start posting it up. Like well, I always like to put up the finished product. Like if we go out out and we have a successful adventure, let the people that were on it communicate it they'll start asking questions about what well where'd you go what'd you do um how come i didn't hear about this the reason you didn't hear about it is because as soon as we posted it and people we quote unquote like filled a roster for every person that wants to commit to a trip like that i have to dedicate about 20 minutes communicating to them and we look for a, like a number threshold, like once, once we hit 20 cars, it's like, all right, that's, that's enough. You know, next year is going to be busier because uh, it's going to be an easier access to run. Like staging point is going to be right off I-90. Couldn't get any easier, right? So that's part of the reason why I don't promote it too much that we're going out and doing a run like this is because it'll get people want too many details and then they won't show up. Right. And, well, and, and you're I, investing I so much that. into planning for them you know it's not just a matter of telling them the details of where it's at it's more like okay we have to now account for that and all the way up to the day you leave there's gonna be people say oh i want to go and then they'll never either either they'll want to bring 20 other people and make a party out of it or they won't show up at all and they now we've planned for another five ten people hundred percent so uh so if anyone's out there but heard about the fact that you're not on this trip uh sorry <laughs> but yeah. we have to keep things under control at some point i mean if you commit to it or you tell me that you commit to it and then uh, something happens last minute where you can't go that happens all the time man it's totally understandable but you know don't don't bury me in direct messages asking every finite detail and then 48 hours before just ah, it's gonna be too too dusty and right. then yeah I'm, I'm over that honestly this sounds super petty i block those people <laughs> or i do at least I mute to. them I, well i block them because i can't have them next time waste that kind of time that i because I, I don't have you know because right. I'm, I'm answering these messages sometimes at midnight right you know and it's, it's 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 nothing personal i just can't i just don't have the time to dedicate it to it so well i'm looking forward to it hopefully if, if everything lines out right and it, and we get the delivery we're expecting uh i'll be taking a four-seater can-am unit on the trip with my two boys i was hoping to take cool. the whole family but the wife just had major surgery so she's not going so one of them could probably ride with me uh i may very well not have a passenger and we may very well not have a media guy he's kind of uh, cameron's kind of 50 50 as to whether or not he's going to be able to pull it off so that whatever you need yeah we'll, so we'll, i mean we'll i'm going to be doing space. some actual content filming while i'm yep. out with the boys doing some actual creative around the experience of me and the boys going out and doing this Killer. so you know the the way that that lines up with the rest of the group is that it doesn't necessarily put us at the front right and yeah. that's where you're going to be so the opportunities there for overlap are going to be probably pretty few but uh we'll see what we can do we can figure out you know ways to make that work yeah. um but uh but i'm really hoping well to i don't want to put any pressure on you either because like <laughs> well what i mean is like y you know the trail system you know where we're going you've been on it um i would much rather have you focused on what you want to accomplish behind the camera as well as the experience with the kids as opposed to like directing people so you feel free to when if people come up to you and want to talk about that and stuff you feel free from an involvement standpoint how far down that rabbit hole you want to <laughs> go i mean there, there 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 should be other well aspects. i mean the whole point of doing this is to show that two angles right there's the family side of it and then there's the community side of it. And so I will be involving everybody at some point with this whole project. But um, the idea is to show that, you know, there's ways to go exploring and, and, and experience the outdoors with your family and create unique experiences interesting memories and experiences while at the same time also joining with, with other people doing the same thing yeah. and and enhancing that experience even more yeah i'm looking forward to it you know it's going to be the first year that we have i, I it's, it's disappointing that i'm saying this but it's a reality and this would be the first year that we've had uh, women drivers out there there's two or three women that are coming by themselves that's rad I'm no so, that's I'm totally so cool. stoked you know and uh, we've got people bringing kids people bringing dogs this hasn't happened before and that's where people were commenting about the pace and right. and i was telling them i'm like there's gonna be spots where you can go 35 35 plus and we if we want to hit trinity lakes and still make it back by sunday we're gonna have to hit those speeds and we yeah, can do it's it not a, it's not a short run this yeah is a, this is an extended run about 550 
I think is what we're looking at somewhere in there. Maybe, yeah. you know, if we take a couple of shortcuts, we could probably shave it down to about 450, four and a quarter, somewhere in there. But I'm telling people to be prepared for 550. Right. Yeah. It's definitely not a small trail. And, and that's my concern when people start, like, I'm all for you having the experience that you want to have on these trips, right? Like if you want to bring your dog, if you want to bring your kids, if you want to do whatever, like there's, everybody's at a different place and a different experience level and a different capacity to handle situations. But when you start adding all those variables in, you start adding opportunities of, I don't want to say failure, but opportunities for things to go awry. Yeah. And if at a driver's meeting, we say we want to lift off, we want to be behind the wheel motors running by nine in the morning. If you've got a lot of outside distractions, it's up to you to make sure that you're planning accordingly, that that alarm gets you up and you're ready to roll by that time. Cause there's 30, you know, 20 other cars that are depending on you being ready. Or just that you're capable of navigating, that you know, yourself to that point or, sure. or that ability to get yourself through the mountains where you need to. And, and having the mindset of like, okay, well, if I'm separating myself, I can't be taking risks. I can't be going, you know, faster than the ability for the machine to not break. You right. know what I mean? Like, so you have to change your mindset depending on those variables. And it's a, it's a thing that people don't take into consideration. They go out, they, they hit a rock or they go out and they try to do a hill climb <clears throat> and take their front A arms out. And, and then all of a sudden they're out of the trip. So hundred percent, but, uh, so it should be a good time. Um, so we got a lot on our plates. We got that, those trips coming up to those events. And then we have our Idaho run that we're going to do. And then after that, I have some more UTV takeover trips in Oklahoma. And then following that is, is Utah, which is going to be huge and epic. We've talked about that before. Um, but, uh, in the meantime, we have industry stuff happening. So we're looking to have, uh, a couple big OEs announce new machines here in the next month. Uh, you know, between now and, and the end of August, we're probably going to hear about the next version of the Polaris vehicles. We're going to probably hear about the next version of the Can-Am. Well, I know we're going to hear about the next version of the Can-Ams because they've already gave us the date, the the, the week of the 11th. So we're going to see... Um, they're, they're having a camera nerd announce work, work as part of that. Yeah, you're, you're excited. Too. You got your little boy toy oh, YouTuber whatever. up on there. Who, who told me about him? <laughs> That'd be you. I just saw it and recognized your connection, so I wanted you to get a little drooly mouth on it. Yeah. And, and All I know is it's going to look pretty. It may not be gnarly, but it's going to look pretty. <laughs> he's definitely going to put his spin uh, on for it. For sure. Well, hopefully yeah. he does. Hopefully he's not just a face for five seconds and yeah. then done, but... What we're joking about here is uh, Peter McKinnon is a YouTube guy. He's a Canon, Canon camera, uh, sponsored sponsored influencer or something like that. I don't know if he's officially sponsored, but he's definitely he gets, an influencer that's given a lot of a leniency and, and ability and I, connections. I don't think he gets paid by Canon, but we know damn good and well he didn't pay for that R5 <laughs> that he shoots on. Um, but nonetheless, he's a really talented guy. He's kind of a goofy personality. I don't know what his off-road background is, but he's he's uh, he's going to be part of the, the Can-Am release. I'm sure Dirt Tracks is probably going to be part of it as oh, well. Oh, for sure. All yeah. the big media outlets will be a part of it, especially all the Canadian ones, especially which Dirt Tracks Canadians. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Peter McKinnon's also a Canadian, and uh, I find it because so you said you're not sure what his background is. His background's mostly on quads, so right, right. Um, that's where he comes from. And that, but I know that he has an X3, and he recently messed his hand all up in some off-road accident because you um, stick your hand out the window when you roll, <laughs> as we all do if as we're not we all do. if we're not like aware of it. Um, but Canucks, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it'll be interesting. Um, the rumor is that we're going to hear about Polaris first um that could be literally today tomorrow the next day we don't know um we haven't got any info on that per se uh i've heard in august the month of august is when we're going to hear polaris that could be the first of august that could be the second of august so the first is a sunday second would be a monday so i would say that if there was any bet i would put down it's either going to be the third or the following tuesday you know, that things are going to start coming out right. and then that would put Can-Am the next following week so that they're out of the news cycle. So I think that's kind of where it's going to fall in line is, is Polaris that first week, Can-Am the second week and then, and then off to the races. Yeah. I've heard that if you have an order in for a Can-Am right now in conjunction with how behind they are in conjunction with that little fire they had down in Juarez, uh, it's very likely if you put an order in today, the model that you get is going to be a 2022. You know, I they, think they based off of the availability of inventory, you're probably going to get a 22. Yeah. Which, um, 
cool. <laughs> right. If <laughs> right nothing's, on. nothing's crazy, right? Right. But I mean, let's talk about that fire for a little bit. That's that was interesting. The so Canam has I think three different major facilities for uh, production, mm-hmm. and one of them is down in Mexico. And uh, their lot where they start stacking up the finished units in their crates caught fire somehow they haven't said you know how that started yet but um as we all know utvs tend to burn well once they're lit um there's a lot of flammable and and combustible components on them most of the entire car is flammable outside of the chassis um and uh you know all those crated cars come with a little bit of gas in them so um they put them through a test procedure and, and make sure that they're all running good before they crate them up and and so there's they i think they it's a little less than a gallon or something like that that's in the gas tanks. Um, and so basically once one started in a stack full, a yard full of stacked units, uh, it was just, you know, it was tinder. So uh, that went up and I think they've, I think they lost over or around a thousand units. Um, and so uh, I love the meme going around the internet now of the, of the guy looking at the players on fire laughing and then looking at the fire in, in Mexico and he's just kind of like dumbfounded that that's even happening. Um, yeah. I, I, the, the whole brand, brand honk, brand loyalty thing i yeah whatever yeah yeah that that's still they a all thing, they all break they all burn they all do all of it so yeah. um but anyways they, that they, they all take your money <laughs> they will definitely all take your money um and uh the the important thing to remember is that you know everybody's saying well now i'm not going to get my x3 or my whatever for not true uh whatever it's just, the, the quote i heard was it put them a, a week behind right so you got to remember that they they produce these things at such speed that if they have the components, if they have all the parts, they can put them together fairly fast. And I think they're starting to recover a little bit from, you know, some of the difficulties they've had on inventory. Um, but I think that there's a bigger discussion that people aren't realizing that when COVID hit and and we all know that the product cycle is going to be doing its big, you know, pendulum swing here going into 22, right? That was a huge opportunity because I mean, a manufacturer's got to wind down their tooling. They got to wind down their inventory levels. They have to wind down all these assets that they've acquired during this product life cycle. So they have all these units, all these parts, all these different things happening, man- manufacturing processes that you have to now convert over to this new product set that you're going to be putting out. And normally what happens is they'll be like, okay, well, we'll introduce one product. Let's just say a Polaris Pro. And, and then eventually a year or two later, they'll put out another version of the car or a different version will adopt that technology or that frame or that look. And then they can start merging in the tooling in the process. But when COVID hit and all the factories were shutting down and all the things, the supply levels were going down. And then we had chip shortage for all those that use technology in their cars, like all the smart stuff and the screens and the, the ride nabs and all that stuff. Um, that was a huge opportunity for, for the OEs to say, hey, let's take a step back look at how this all plans out over the next year or two, maybe we should take an opportunity to, I don't want to say they artificially limited supply, but they took the opportunity. I think my opinion, this is me speaking on my own behalf, not of any OEs that I think that all the big OEs have enough smart people working there that they were like, Hey, we have an opportunity to not have to waste time winding down everything. We can start making transitions now. And if they started doing that, you would have limited inventory, you would have limited production, and you would be able to get ahead of the curve when you go to launch a new product and have more product in a market that's ready to buy, that's hot, when you launch your product. Instead of being two months out, three months out, four months out on a new product, you could be ready at the get-go. So I have a prediction that within this next couple months, you're going to be seeing units out on the dirt being videoed, being tested, being sure. worked through the process of media coverage and people buying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm really... Oh, in- no. Can you change your battery? Oh. And yeah, we're back. <laughs> Got to hit anything or are we, are we good to go? So, um, is no, that, you're are good. we recording? We're still recording. Yeah, are you sure? Nothing stopped. Are you sure? Yeah. Let's let's go through the checklist. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, OEs. OEs. Uh, I, b- before the camera went dead, I was actually... I wanted to talk about the aftermarket. Like... In the aftermarket, you're noticing machines get bigger, more power, but you're also seeing, like Ride Command, you got your you got your heads up display technology. Technology. Now you're starting to see audio. Um, how long before Kicker 
has a <laughs> ultimate is is in the ultimate models on the Polaris's. Fosgate is already in the premium models for the Can Ams, so you're getting just enough audio that might inspire somebody not to buy an aftermarket audio kit because it already th- they bought a machine that already came with it. I mean, within five years, do you see PCI being in every premium model Can Am? Do you see rugged being in every pre- premium model Polaris? So, like from the aftermarket standpoint, it kind of begs begs the question whether or not. What's next for the aftermarket? I think if you're in the business of making radius rods, trailing arms, tie rods, you're just going to ascend. You're just going to keep ascending. But some of the luxury, some of the IC components I see being more available moving forward in the in the newer models, especially audio. Yeah. So, I mean, we already have, um, like you said, <clears throat> the ultimate and the premium models of all these cars now have audio options integrated. I mean, KRX has the uh, Hyphonic system, which is MB Court. Uh, Polaris used to have MB Court. Now they're uh, Fosgate. And then Fosgate or Kicker, one of the two. I, I don't think remember. they're Kicker, aren't they? Um, and so basically they're all just low-end, like stage two, stage four systems. Uh, basically just normal stereos. Um, but you can then upgrade to include a sub or rear pods or whatever. But yeah, you can upgrade to premium audio with an aftermarket accessory. Um, the the <clears throat> the components like trailing arms and radius rods and all that, um, that's an ever-expanding category just because... It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere, right? You're going to always need those parts. They're consumables. Um, the interesting thing is that we now have these rumored new models coming out, and those are all new designs, all new dis- dimensions, all new geometry, which then just gives all the aftermarket it up. all new SKUs. Yep. Right. So um, they're they're going to benefit from a new model release, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think the big one that you and I have talked about at length is the, the Pro R, and the Pro R has become. Wait, we've talked about a Pro R. Before? Well, it's become this the it's become subject matter that gets quite comical online you know <laughs> we I, are the forum memes of choice oh yeah no i i see the picture that you do we need to go down this road? <laughs> we, i've there, seen there that. is a picture that exists that should not exist but does exist because a certain group put it out yeah that didn't know that they were and within the last 24 hours even though that pick is almost two years old <laughs> um, within the last 24 hours uh it's making the rounds again and people right. are kind of laughing at its existence it exists. We know the, people. The who photo have seen is it. not computer generated. <laughs> I have impl- I have coworkers at my company that have visibly seen the car at Polaris. You know, it's uh, you know we, we were part of a we were part of a bid process to take on their business and and there's other athletes we've talked to that all are on board with the program and everything else on our show. They've, <laughs> they've admitted that they've seen it, but it it begs the question if they just pump the brakes a little bit because of COVID. Totally logical. That that they would do that. Um, But all I can tell you is I'm getting really stir crazy right now, dude. (laughs) As is the entire industry. I'm coming off the rails right now. (laughs) I'm looking at pre-runners, like seriously, like V8 Ranger Toyota pre-runners, just gnarly freaking long travel builds, you know desert worthy stuff. I'm getting bored. Like my (laughs) X3, my X3 is right where I want it, maybe just a little more power, something like that, but I'm I'm already looking on the next project. And if Polaris drops that Pro R and it is what what we we've heard, seventy five inches, what, two hundred and five horsepower, two hundred and ten, maybe more, somewhere in there. I'm going to have to take a really hard look at it, for sure. <laughs> well, and especially with your experience with the pro four-seater that you have, um, you know, you've, sp- you've spoken before that you enjoy that, that chassis and that, that platform. It's a boat. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It floats. Well, I mean, the four-seater <laughs> is definitely a huge boat, uh, and it's a bigger car, for sure, than we're used to. Um, but the pro platform has proven itself as a viable contender in the high-performance game. Right, right. And uh, putting a new power plant into it and all that is is just the next evolution of that. And there and their long-term strategy right like that's all been a part of this plan a long time so um the pro platform has been meant and built and designed around a bigger power plant and a bigger drivetrain and all that so um, and if it's legit two liters man the the headroom on that so what what do you think if we go to a two liter how does the industry change over the next six months uh, I think everybody goes into chase mode at that point because we've heard numbers like 300 horsepower from other manufacturers. How they get to 300, if they're getting to 300 by adding more boost to small displacement or if they're getting to 300 by adding less boost to bigger displacement. If that's the route, if if they go 
bigger displacement, less boost. To me, that kind of loosely translates to a little bit more reliability. But if nobody has made that jump into terms of more displacement, I think the manufacturers are going to go into chase mode real quick. And and that would be Can-Am and maybe Kawasaki. I don't see Yamaha chasing and I don't see Honda chasing. I see them continuing to do their own thing. Although we have heard rumors from some well-placed people that Yamaha is working on a monster. Right. We'll see. Well, and I think the the interesting thing is I don't my perspective is the only people that would be chasing that would be Can-Am. I think 100%. Only, I think Polaris and Can-Am would be the only two that really seriously invest into going that way. Um, I've heard rumors of multiple turbos spooled on the motor so you know turbo per cylinder setups i haven't heard um, that. and so you know that could be something we're looking at with the can-am for for instance like this is completely rumor off off the rails like no credibility of me being able to prov- provide anything on this but if can-am were to say hey we don't want to make a bigger block we want to keep what we have and just get it and just quicker. get it spooling faster with more reliable turbos and i mean we've seen that our r series come out with a better beefier system with better components and better cooling and all that to get more more horsepower out of them put them at that 200 mark right if they were to say hey we're going to take that same investment of technology and then just multiply that across the cylinder range and just make smaller turbos you know you potentially could reduce your temperature you could reduce your spool up time you could put out higher faster more torquey horsepower so you know that might be their competitive advantage you know but at the same time if the pro r comes out with this rumored you know bigger motor non-turbo right then there's nothing to compete with it like nobody has sure a naturally aspirated motor that size with that much power to compete so they could be creating a niche for themselves for the next few years while everyone keep catches up and figures out what they're going to do and if you're polaris what do you do because <clears throat> you have this thing up your sleeve everybody knows about it it hasn't been released yet do you release it in august or do you release it at Halloween? Because I've heard it's a very poorly kept secret that Camp RZR is a go, that they're going to have it this year. So I haven't even That's looked into where that. I would so, release. so Camp Razor seems to be a go? 100%. I've heard that from... I, I have yet to hear somebody say that it's not a go. And this is all in That could people. be the tell, right? Like if we're not hearing people say it's not happening, right. but they're just officially not advertising it. Right. My, my concern would be if you're going to put on that big of an event and not advertise it up until the month of the event, that'd be kind of risky. You get 300,000 people at that event, regardless of whether they advertise it or not. It'll be nuts. Well, they do have lock-in brand recognition on the event and the local and being they own in the property. <laughs> And they own the, yeah. <laughs> they own half a glam for sure. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, what are your predictions? Let's just say let's just do a quick predictions round, like hot takes of what we think is going to come down the pipe. All right, on I'll, both. On, I'll go first. I'm not going to put in Yamaha. I'm not going to put in Cowie. I'm not going to put any of those. We're just going to say purely Polaris, Can Am, the two big dogs, the two that are expected to come out within the next sixty days. You know what are we going to predict they're going to do? We, we uh, so I'm just going to keep it to sport models for now. Yeah, uh, we're just we're going to talk yeah, top dogs, and, and we and we can jump into the dual star sports stuff. The dual sports stuff is actually slowly but surely coming out. The RZR Trail, uh, high better feature, gen, you know, more features to the general to the Ranger. You know, so that platform is, dude. If you're in the biz, if you want to buy a Ranger, you're buying a awesome car right now man like yeah. a general i mean you're buying something that's just totally totally tw- tweaked but as far as what my predictions would be i don't see anything going on with the turbo s i think if they bring out uh the 2022 turbo s you probably see some color changes stuff like that maybe some technology changes yeah uh, maybe some audio uh i see the pro Oh, man, if I were to make a prediction, I'd, I see the Pro going to long travel. I see them offering up a 72-inch, maybe even a little bit wider. Uh, I, that's what I, That's my wish list. I really want them to do that. I, so do you think they go Pro S, or do you think they go and, and keep the Turbo S, or do you think they discontinue Turbo S and I go would Pro ne- S? I would never discontinue the Turbo S. I think it's one of the best cars made, even though it's what? 2018 but the reason you're saying that is because it's a proven platform that's evolved over time and it's reliable and all that and the aftermarket has unlimited support for that chassis but the pro platform has now been out for two years and if they move up into this bigger plat bigger wider stance there's no reason for them to have two cars in the same category doing the same thing. Theoretically, yeah. I, I just, uh, I, you, you and I have discussed that the Pro just seems to be the chassis that they want to move forward with. Um, 
more headroom, more room in the more engine compartment, everything. It just checked. They, better they, frame, they, better geometry, they, better they, everything. They be, they built that thing to check off a lot of things. And I, I think the only thing missing is 72 to 72 plus inches wide. Um, if you've ever ridden in a long travel car, you know what I'm talking about. Um, let's put it to you like this. We were, we were out in an event in Idaho, and the guy that I was riding with has a pro four-seater. We have a pro-seater. He's on a 64-inch on stock 30s on the dynamic suspension and when he would go out and ride it's a great car it's an amazing amazing machine it was it was taking that uh, that desert abuse no problem whatsoever then he hopped in mine and he was like this is just different it's a completely different car different i'm like you know the width the uh the shot uh, the 72 i'm sorry the uh springs and the which are eibach and the mts tune let me tell you it just that car just handles like you wouldn't believe like it, it's a joke it i found a, a gnarly hit big jump out there that you could hit at 70 if you wanted to and the first time i had my wife and my kid in the car i was going about 60 at it and i said hey guys close your eyes they're like what <laughs> i'm like close your eyes so they close their eyes and i'm doing like 60s now right before we hit it 30 yards before we hit it i'm like Okay, open them. Screaming ensues. <laughs> <laughs> Launch right off of it. Nothing. Barely even notice you hit it. Yeah. That, that that long travel is just stupid. Yeah. Once you go long travel, big tires, correct springs, good valving. Like it's a joke how much those cars can do. And it's, I think that's a that's a just like people don't understand. They buy these cars. They they maybe do a shock therapy to an them or they do whatever on their standard stock geometry and everything like that. And they think they've got an amazing car. But when you put the time and energy and, and money into getting custom valving, getting custom rate springs, getting all that stuff on a wide, capable platform that's stiff, rigid, high power, good clutching. When you get to that pro level of, a, of performance on your car, it's a different world. If you, you can actually tune your car's suspension for the price of a cage... The price of audio, maybe even cheaper, once you consider the install and stuff. So, if if you wanted to tune your shocks and tweak your uh, tweak your springs, the cost isn't near what people think. I mean, you're talking somewhere between sixteen hundred to two thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, but uh, you can absorb that kind of money in lighting. You can do it in a cage, especially if you're on a four seater. You can do it in wheels and tires. I'm leaning to very much like motocross where it's one of the first modifications i'm going to do right out of the box of a new machine is tweak that suspension and just get, get you know tune it the the difference in its handling con- characteristics you'd have to ride in it to understand right you do not feel in most cases you do not feel a thing at high speed or at low speed after you've tuned your suspension the the funny thing is that like well f- for first of all i'm going to cl- clarify the first thing I'm always going to recommend, no matter what car it is, no matter what manufacturer it is, One, cage and harness. Two. Oh, you ruined. <laughs> cage and harness. Cage and harness, without be, a doubt, is, is without a doubt what you should be doing. Now, if your car comes with a, some sort of like click and harness system and all that stuff, fine. That's whatever. I mean, it's not it's not great, but it's better than a three point. And if you're going to go, you know, ride these cars, you should have a cage. Just straight out, get a cage. Um, now, beyond that, moving on. Performance-wise, a lot of people start talking about More wheels, power. wheels and tires, power, clutching, yep. all these different things. And it's amazing how much better the car performs when it has proper tuned suspension. Yeah. And so if you're talking about, you know, my, my throttle response isn't quite there or, you know, when I get into the corners, like it, my clutch seems to like give out a little bit and, and get soft or whatever. A lot of times that's just so your suspension soaking up all the power. Like if you're putting down power and your suspension is just getting super wore out and super faded you're going to lose that ability to, to sling around a corner and right. drive with your rear and all that stuff. So right. um, tuning uh, suspension is going to be huge. So back to the topic that we were talking about before we get too far down that rabbit hole, the predictions. You Man, said, we, yeah, we just got totally derailed. There. Um, <laughs> the, you're saying the pro, the pro system wide stance with that, better. That's almost uh, a wish as opposed to a prediction. Like just with COVID and stuff like that and supply issues, it wouldn't surprise me if the Pro just gets improved, even if it stays at 64 inches. But uh, I would love to see it go wider. That'd be right. killer. So if we're sticking to the Polaris side, I'm going to predict that we do see the Pro R come out, whether that be the name that they stick with or whatever. Um, I think that the Turbo S goes away. 
this this year. I think really? that I think that the inventory, if it if we see 2022 inventory of a Turbo S, I think it's just going to be the remaining inventory of back stock, and that it'll fade out by spring. Um, and I th- I foresee us come seeing a a Pro come out either the R replacing the S or a new lineup that looks Pro XP, Pro S, Pro R, and then that that supplements and replaces all the previous Turbo class XPs. Yeah. And the only thing that you're left with is the XP 900s, XP, or the Trail 900 S's and the 1000 S's, the XP 1000s, and that everything high performance now is on the Pro platform. I, I think one of the cool things about the Pro is is it's been out for two years, so it's been out a while, and we are starting to see more and more and more of them out on the sand. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because people were so impatient. It's because there's that much better. <laughs> I, well, but, the th- but people didn't know that. Like, I, there was some resistance to the Pro when it first came out. They're like, they didn't, certain features they didn't like. You know, I heard people say that certain features of it were ugly. I've heard, which is ridiculous. But uh, they didn't like the width. They, they didn't like this. They were just like, I'm going to stick on the RZR platform. You mean all the things Turbo they complained S. about going into it, that the X3 had all these better things, and then the Pro adopted, and now they're complaining about it? There, there's a component to that for sure, but like it, uh, it kind of makes me wonder if people bought the Pro because it was available. Because you're starting, you know, you, you could go to a dealership to, there to buy a Turbo S, and they tell you it's going to be six months. Well, I got this Pro right here. Bang. I think that's a, that's a big part of it. It but could I th- be. But, but I think the other part th- of it is people like me, when I go, like I just this week been shopping around for various things. I Like A-arms? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, backstory. Anyways, <laughs> uh, the, when you go to buy something, that's a big investment. Do you buy something that is possibly going to get discontinued, or do you buy something that's going to have a long lifespan after you buy it? Uh, yeah, I go with B for sure. Right, but I think that, that with the Pro is if you're in that position, you bought it because it was available. You're not disappointed now. That's no, sure. I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed. No. I, mean, I mean, the other part of that is when it first came out, there was no aftermarket for it. Right when it first was introduced, so you had no awesome looking cages for it. You had no awesome looking bumpers for it. The thing about the Pro, then full throttle build theirs, and it was like, man, look what's possible. <laughs> so what happens is you get the aftermarket coming out saying, okay, we're going to mitigate a lot of that sh- sticker shock of the beauty changes to it by supplementing it with all these new things. And once you get those, that's why it's important for people to build cool cars and to build influential like influencers to build cool things because. That's what really shows off what's possible. And the OEs are never going to go and say, hey, let's go get all the aftermarket that we don't own and put it on the car and promote that. Like, they're never going to do that. So that's why it's important to see all these cool builds because that's what inspires you. That's what gives you the inspiration to do things and and what's possible on these cars. Jump to Can-Am. So Can-Am, uh, I'll start with that one. So I have no insider information. And just neither, so everybody neither of us do. Just so everybody knows, I pressed them to get that information, and they said that that is not going to happen. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, I foresee them sticking with their triple that they have currently. I foresee them coming out with some new hot tunes, possibly some turbo upgrades, uh, intercooler options, things like that, that change kind of the format of how that's laid out. Possibly, if they want to prolong the life of that triple they could go multiple turbos um and i think that would be smart because it would give you the ability like i said all the benefits of a smaller turbo option that spool up faster do all that stuff but it also doesn't require them to change their entire platform so KM has literally not changed the look of any of their x like we're talking sport models right so we're talking x3s they have not changed a single plastic on that thing since it came out yeah, I, I've heard rumors, and those rumors have been 60 to 80% more power than it's currently making. I don't know if that's on another chassis altogether. I don't know if it's on the X3 chassis. Um, I like the X3 chassis. I love the Max. The, the only complaint that I have about the Max is the back seat. The back seat for a taller person is not really adequate. You know, it, it, if you're over the age of 12, fitting in the back seat is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um or uh, I, I think the back seat's made for people that are less than them, like 5'10", somewhere in there. I think you could probably fit in there pretty good. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, that thing is a 9 tenths class 10, you know, 
It's a right. nine tenths class tenth, so its suspension geometry is really ideal, and it's a great it, platform. Some would argue that it's a little too long, um, but I think sure that, that you know if it's well equipped, it, it's not a big problem. But you're I, not going to notice that in the desert. Um, some would argue that the whoops, depending on where you're at, is it becomes a problem. But I would say that properly tuned suspension fixes a lot of that, right? So. Um, the thing about, about going up to, so here's my, here's my concern with the high horsepower, right? Let's just take into consideration what's capable and what's possible and what people actually end up doing with these cars. Once you hit 200 horsepower, right? You're not going 30 miles an hour down the trail. If you have 300 horsepower, you're not going through the dunes and doing a, a nice casually stroll through the dunes when you have 200 plus horsepower, right? Is there a responsibility on the manufacturers to now say, we're coming out with a bigger, higher higher horsepower setup, and there's a bunch of new regulations going to be coming in if we're going bigger than a liter, right? Do they now reinvent the cage system, the ROPs that they use, and come out with some sort of better, beefier setup? Because if you're going to have that much power, you're going to push it at some point how many people do you see on the online forums put up that they just got into the hey guys i'm new here just get, just picked up my max rr you know me the two kids and the wife are going to go out yeah i mean for sure the, those it, it concerns me when i see that you know i see people that say uh they're making their first trip their first time their first overall experience behind the wheel and they're going to florence you know, Florence is the sketchiest dunes in, in Oregon, and it's not even close. Everybody knows that. And I, I've told, I've had to chime in on a couple of exceptions. I'm just like, hey, go to Winchester. It's cooler, meaning it's there's cooler features to ride. It's more open, and it's infinitely safer. But I, I am wondering if they start to change displacement or something, if there's going to be some sort of pre-qualification, almost like a motorcycle license to operate these things in the next five to 10 years. It wouldn't, it would suck, you know, just be a pain in the butt for better, better drivers, but it'd be great for noobs. Right. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, the interesting thing about the pro being the, one of the big selling points is that it's a single piece stiffer chassis, right? If they were just to say, Hey, everything from this level up, this trim up has the upgraded, steel you know thickness walls on the tubes and all that stuff i i think there would be who of them to to do that i yeah. I, don't, I don't foresee any moral reason to not do that when you're coming out with a 200 plus horsepower car yeah it's we we've talked about how some of these changes and some of these rumors are some of the worst kept secrets in off-road i think everybody at polaris unless they're not paying attention probably has a pretty good idea what can-am has company coming for sure and i'm sure everybody at can-am has an idea what Polaris has coming. They have no clue. They, didn't, they, they don't even know what it looks like. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I look at that and I'm just, are, are they just kind of staring each other down, seeing who goes first? Um, I think it's more along just the business logistics. Like, I don't think anyone is even considering like who's first or who's second or whatever. Right. I think it's just, they have their own schedules of how things work out with their logistics. Yeah. And, and so that's how it comes out. So if you, uh, are CEO of Polaris or Can-Am, what are you, what are you doing? Are, are you, are you going to try and focus? Cause you know, Can-Am just came out with the new commander. It's wicked. You know, is that kind of where you're going to try and market to, to the people that want to do dual sport stuff? Are you all about trying to uh, reinvent the wheel and push the boundaries in the desert? So the big thing that we have to remember is that, you know, the old nomenclature of, you know, what wins on Saturday sells on Monday or whatever, however that goes. That, that's an old supercross term. That's an old, old term. saying, right? Yeah. But it's still somewhat applicable. Like everyone that we go to the dunes and talk to, the reason they have the X3 is because the X3 is the car that wins the dunes, right? And or the off-road desert scene. You go out in the trails, you ask them why they what they bought. They're buying a Razor because that's the overall trail machine, right? Um, and so I think Can Am's definitely going to focus on maintaining that visibility in the desert. And I think Polaris has a little bit of catch up to do there. Uh, they haven't won King Hammers and stuff like that for a little while. They haven't really dominated that scene for a while. And I think they're going to try to catch up to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think that Polaris on the other, that the difference between Can-Am and Polaris is that Can-Am has been on this like streak of like dominating racing and, you know, Yamaha, when they came out, that was their streak to have. And then Can-Am took it from them. Um, you're talking short course, short course racing, or just racing in general. Uh, dominant X, Yamaha was definitely short course focused, but in the in the bigger picture, just talking racing. So, 
I Polar- think Polaris is all over that on that RS1 right now. Well, so so that's a conversation that people are having right now is is are we going to see an RS1 update? That'd be sick. That'd be so, so sick. You and me, the consumer, are going. That would be awesome. Yeah, I rode I rode with Kyle from Dune and Destroy at Takeover multiple times, and I'm just looking at that RS1. I'm like, why have I neglected that car? It's an awesome platform. It's but here's the thing: that car came to reality based off of Polaris trying to be awesome in the race scene. Right. Now they're in a position where the short course doesn't necessarily matter to them as much as desert racing does. Yeah. So if RS1 comes out at 72 inches with a turbo on it and it's nineteen thousand dollars. What would you do? Try to get one. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, I just be, don't... That would be insane. I just don't see that. I think the focus will be on the pro platform and right. to, to prove it and to solidify it. Yeah, You know, I got to admit, man, like uh, at the last two events, uh, you know, my Can-Am's been around a while. It's uh, it's the old black and blue one, you know, so it's a 2019. It doesn't The have, old black and blue one. Well, nonetheless, like uh, when I park the pro and the Can-Am next to each other, people will come and drool on the Can-Am, but it's two to one that they drool on that pro. It's pretty cool. Well, it's because it's up in the air and it looks like a monster truck. Yeah, there's, there's that. They see that big freaking Baja rack on the top of it with 80 billion lumens and stuff like that and it's just they're <laughs> so all about it. also i gave you crap about that thing the more i it see it, it it's growing, growing on me yeah, yeah. i will still say it's those that tmw doors bud it's the doors it help a lot off. but i i'm talking specifically about the lights and the rack i gave you crap about the flipped up like <laughs> wait, wait, hat till look. Turn, wait till you see them on <laughs> <laughs> but the but I still, I still maintain that I think you should put another LP4 on, or LP6 on the side, but I think it's growing on me. So. Yeah, I could probably uh, displace those LP4s that are on the sides for LP6s and have those LP4s find their way onto my Ram truck. That would, <laughs> that would be a bad thing. <laughs> Wouldn't it be the worst no, option? No, I, I, I really, I t- I, I've talked to you about this. Like when that car is down and it's being wrenched on and stuff, I really miss it. It's right. so much fun. And my family love it they yeah for sure and love it the 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 it has the um was a brick city fab cage yep. on it right it's a great looking cage but it does slope down in the back to match the shoulders at the yeah. at the c-pillar right it looks so, really good um i think that the comfort level for a family if you were to put like a canna max or a turbo s four seater or and the pro four seater next to each other and have people to get in them I think every single one of them is going to say the pro four seater is the most comfortable, most natural feeling car to sit in in the back seat. The funny thing is, though, is that thing so far up in the air that the people have asked me to sit in. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, and they try, they struggle getting into it because it's, <laughs> it's got that Jeep lip. You yeah, know? like when you get I into don't it, it's understand got that Jeep lip. the design decision between that. So oh, if I you have look no at, problem with it. Look, at, if you look at all the Polaris's previous, like all the XP platforms, the 900s, everything, all the approach angles for getting in the driver's seat are down low. Sure. And you look at the Can-Ams, you look at all of them. Every single car in the market has a low entry point, dude. except for the Pro. The Pro goes, hey, we're going to put it uphill just to play with you. Dude, the Pro actually has the same drive. Uh, I, I, I drive the Pro in a similar position that I used to drive an old Peterbilt. Serious, like you could just jack the wheel way forward. And yeah, you but I'm talking it. about getting into the car, not, uh, not once you're in the car. I'm six four. All those midgets. I mean, whatever. If they have, if they struggle getting in and out of it, I guess that's their thing. But <laughs> so when do we start seeing the automated, uh, the automated the, the step steps? ups? <laughs> I hope never, but you never know. Yeah, maybe but that's that, an opportunity for yeah. me to innovate. But yeah, that pro, you know, we're on 72 inches when we were out there in the Idaho desert. Like, uh, I, I took it on some, on some, uh, trails that were not wide at all. We have a boulder in the middle of the trail that yeah, I have to go around and my, my outside tire is hanging off a ravine where it's death if you go off of it. And, uh, we still made it. It, it was pretty good. You know, the back tire would push me towards the ravine, um, <laughs> when it hit it. But yeah, it, it was such a, f- that, that machine was so fun out there. And what we're talking about is we're talking about rally in the pines, did rally in the pines, uh, last week it was dirty. I can't even tell you guys where it was located. They literally have me, it wasn't, I didn't have to sign an NDA, but it was a handshake agreement where we do not discuss where that event was held. I, all I can tell you is it's South of Salmon, Idaho, and it's near the foothills of the biggest mountain range in Idaho. And let me tell you, dude, you could host a 1,000-mile desert race out there, no problem at all. It's that wide. It's that big. I mean, when you jump off the highway, it is a 15 – or I'm sorry, it's probably – I want to say it's about a 45-mile drive just to get into the, to the base camp. It was – 
it's in there, man. It's in no man's land. Like if I had to describe it to somebody, nobody could find that place. You'd, you'd need very specific maps. Right. So to wrap up predictions, uh, we both think that they're going to come out with high horsepower over 200 horse. We both think that they're going to come out wide, bigger platform. Uh, do you think can comes out with visual changes? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I think, uh, they, they may try to expand a little bit on the audio side of things. You know, the, the big maxes were coming with the, uh, big Fosgate audio up on the roof, kind of all over the car. I wouldn't be surprised if they make some changes in there. I wouldn't be surprised if they do a little better heads up display, like nav screen, you know, I was going to say that my, my prediction is that they come out with a whole new product set of technology. Right. I think that's where they're going to start. Cause Polaris has dominated that game for a while and with Yamaha, ride command and Yamaha's into and it. Yamaha has their their det- detachable nav tablet that goes in the in the dash, and I think that's based on the Magellan platform. The one yeah, Yamaha's, it is, yeah, it, 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 which is solid. You know, yeah. I bitch about it, but it, but it, it always did good for me. <laughs> yeah, so. it doesn't do a bad job. Yeah, um, and they got custom software on it for the Yamaha and everything. But 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 basically, everyone agrees Polaris has dominated that space, the technology integration to these cars um, up to this point, and and we see that um, Can Am came out with their their active shock system with smart shocks which is just you know another version of dynamics right which is just a another version of uh, fox dynamic shock system um but they came out with extra sensors they came out with extra tech on top of that instead of just doing iqs or just doing you know the dynamic shock by itself so they they have investment into additional sensors yeah i think they're also investing into a new technology platform so i think that we're going to see a whole new dash system. I think we're going to see a whole new console system, maybe some better cabin improvements, maybe some better doors, something like that going along with it, your actual cabin experience. Yeah. Um, and by God, I hope they kind of revolutionize that to center tunnel and the wiring setup they got going on. Oh, there. for sure. For sure. Um, you know, and let, let's try not to be just Can-Am and Polaris only in, in relation to this. I know that there's a lot of Kawasaki users out there. You and I have been sworn to secrecy on this. Cowie's got something coming, man. It's it's going to be kind of cool. I think a rumor I heard was maybe spring, kind of early summer of 2022 where they would announce it, and uh, I haven't seen it. All I've heard is rumors, and those rumors sound really cool. It sounds like it's going to kind of be based on the Terex pla- or the, the uh, KRX. KRX platform. Um, just expect more bigger <laughs> all the things there it is that's so, all i'm gonna say so to stoke the fire obviously every manufacturer is gonna try to come out with something new i haven't heard counteracting any, have you heard anything about honda i have not heard anything about honda i don't think honda is interested in playing the game i think they're just we got the product out do we're our good thing. with it we're gonna do our thing um i think cowie has some room to grow and in the segment i think that they've lost enough market share in their other smaller platforms that they need to reinvigorate it a little bit um you see that then they put a lot of energy in their motorbikes and their supercharged bikes and all that other stuff i think they're going to put some of that that their, their what some of their supercharged bikes supercharged uh huh? so i think that some of that energy Energy is going to follow into the KRX platform yep. and 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 not just like bolster it, but solidify the reason why they went that route. Um, and then uh, with uh, let's say uh, Yamaha, we've talked a little bit about you know what they've patents and things like that. I think we're not going to see what we saw in the patents. I think we're just going to see a new powertrain and possibly maybe um, you know a chassis redesign with the the lengths and the ge- geometry there. Yeah, I've got no detail in regards to what Yamaha might do with a sport machine. None whatsoever. I, I, I really would like to see something new from them for sure. I mean, we're in we're about to go into 2022, so the YXE is six years old and, yeah. they, and they've been continually tweaking that chassis. I mean, there's a market something fierce for a shifter car in this industry guys love a clutch guys love to shift and that car to the right user has been really successful and it's built a lot of loyalty um yamaha guys tend to be pretty dang loyal to that car you know and i i but here's the problem though is that every yz owner owns their yz for four to three to five years and then, and when they start getting to that three to four year mark, they all start saying, well, maybe I should go look around and see what's out there. Get a little more power or something like that. Or yeah. just capability. Yeah. Like they all, I mean, short, the, the tight nimbleness of the car is fine, but everybody you want to ride with is all doing more. Well, you know, I didn't long travel my YXE and I didn't tune its suspension. So I, I know had I done stuff like that, it would have really improved the characteristics of the car. I didn't, I didn't turbo it or I didn't do anything like that, but 
uh YXE guys that I used to ride with, some of my buddies and stuff, some of the people that I would correspond with online, when I moved to the X3, they kind of gave me a little bit of crap about that. It's like, oh, yeah, he broke an A-arm, huh? Oh, yeah, he broke this, huh? I'm like, yeah, you do realize that I'm slamming into the same features at almost 25 to 30% quicker than I was doing it on the YXE. Like, the YXE is not going to, it's it's probably, gonna, it's going to take some abuse too, you know, and um, they got to take. But you're also going faster higher longer further 100%. all that and so there's there's an argument for the yxe there, there's no doubt about that but when you start talking about the bigger picture the car just doesn't hold up to the modern machines yeah and so yamaha really does have to innovate yeah it, it, the yxe if you throw a turbo and a long travel on a yxe and you go rage on some bowls i mean is there a better experience in a side-by-side i i don't know you know but once you start slamming through whoops and stuff like that you better know a good chiropractor i mean in, well, the in thing my is, case, is they would have guy, to they would have to change to a trailing arm setup go wider a little bit longer for that car to keep up with anyone else in the in the whoops for sure i'm just in general like you can't stick with an a-arm rear end and and that short platform i think i saw probably 10 yxes rolled over at at utv takeover like a hill fest i'm just in general just like i saw that many of them rolled over and and they don't do anything to do it they just go into a berm or something and all of a sudden they're on their side there was a there was a couple of them rolled over on the night ride that i went on too for sure yeah i saw some collection of people out there uh trying to get it tipped back on its side but they just don't have the footprint yeah it might roll over but it's not going to break anything doing it that's for sure i'm not saying that they would (laughs) but but my point is is that the car itself was great when it came out for what it was but in the modern day utv market it just doesn't hold up and i think they have the ability the capability the technology the engineers the manufacturing process to dominate we've said this before they have the ability to dominate they just choose not to yeah i i I agree you know i just i don't know who's uh who's kind of in charge of those plans you know and if there's one bitch that i have in this entire industry it's suzuki suzuki's been on record saying that utv is a fad and it's going to go away well here we are freaking 13 14 years later since the advent of the rzr and it hasn't gone anywhere if anything you know if you go onto a motorcycle dual sport page or an enduro page or something like that those guys are bitching about side-by-side people they're just going oh yeah you know the utv's come in here and they freaking jack up our trail systems and i just want to tell those guys i'm like you realize you are the overwhelming minority now you well, realize for every, before they came around you were the ones out on the trails screwing up the trail system well so. i mean it's like for every for every honda cr 250 and 450 that that honda sells i wouldn't be surprised if polaris sells freaking 10 rzrs right you know so it's just there it's something that you guys are going to have to get used to you're going to have to get used to seeing those bikes out there and believe me i was a bike guy too you know and i know guys don't want to hear that but you need to be objective about this side by sides aren't going anywhere and that reminds me what i was a topic i missed when i was talking about the pro going and trying to solidify the pro platform and and the the racing sells on monday I think that they're investing a lot of energy into those sport platforms so that they can sell the trail platforms. Sure. I think I think what they're going to do is they're going to say this is the big dog and now you can see some of that geometry, some of that technology into the trail machines and I think we're going to end up seeing <clears throat> at some point those trail machines, those those sport utility vehicles, the generals, the commanders with the whatevers are going to have a sport platform option where they say like a general s like a general s or whatever where they come out with a little bit more horsepower option they come out with a wider stance a bigger appointments things like that yeah and we've had to endure people talking smack online and stuff like that when we promote this oh all you guys care about is dunes all you care about is desert no we're mountain riders predominantly by and funny thing is we do a lot of this coverage on the dunes but we primarily just want to be out in the mountains but that's where the that's where the events are held i mean if if you had If you had a thousand acres for a bunch of RVs to plop somewhere in the Rocky Mountains to go host an event there, giddy up. So here's an idea. We throw an event that you can only get to on UTV. So you have to stage somewhere, but you can only get to it on UTV. And it's in the middle of the mountain somewhere. The location itself is not known until the week of the event. And you have to have bought the tickets and bought the entrance and all that to get the the waypoint. And it's up to, for you, up to you to get yourself there. But once you're there, the fun happens. I mean, that, that'd be cool. The only the only problem you'd have to solve is gas. That's that's really it. It's just fuel accessibility, you know. I, well, I, but if you do it within 50 miles of the 
of the camp. 50 blowout. miles. My, my car is barely warmed up after 50 miles, man. But that's what I'm saying. Like 50 miles will get you to the event. You can do all the stuff and then you can still go out, have fun and get back to camp. Yeah. And, and there's certain states where something like that would work really well. You know, their states are very, very accommodating to off-roaders, you know, Wyoming, Idaho, um, end of list <laughs> but, yeah so um yeah I, I i totally i i could totally see a mountain event being very very successful you know it, it and just, it doesn't have to be something like crazy it doesn't have to be something off the wall it just says like hey this is exclusive and the only way you can be there is if you're capable enough to go get it for sure for sure i mean that sounds to me a little bit like peterson's ultimate adventure with exception to the fact that that's an, a dedicated like rally you know guys aren't let known when and where or I mean, they know when they don't know where up until like a week and a half in advance so it's almost like an invite only thing i might have to develop this idea a little more. how about that oh, no doubt i mean uh, you and i were talking about uh, we're doing all these predictions honestly the most exciting predictions for me is the dual spurt platforms you know the the the, uh, the high performance machines are just going to continue to ascend and that's awesome but i would love to see where can am takes the commander where the rmax goes and where the uh general goes and the, even the ranger but, yeah i mean you, you and i've had this conversation some guy was giving me a hard time about the fact that all i like is big sand cars and, and sand and stuff like that i'm like dude you realize that the machine that i'm most excited about in the entire industry is a defender mr Serious, I love that thing. I told you that there was an opportunity for me to get uh, a, an a, a MR or a, is it MR? XM? MR. XMR. Oh, there XMR, yeah. An yeah. XMR Defender, and your eyes lit up, oh, and you were so it. stoked for it. Yeah. And then it didn't happen, and you were like, and oh, Chris, and sad Christmas boy. was canceled. <laughs> so, um, but on the other hand, we might have a Defender Limited with the AC and the, all that stuff coming up. So, so we'll killer. see what that looks yeah. like. And that's not me being a Can Am honk. That's just me really liking that machine. Because, yeah. uh, I mean, dude, I could make a Ranger or a General do anything that I want. I'm, I'm so stoked on the, those type of dual purpose platforms. The only, it's just a couple of tools weeks and it's right where i want it well and the funny thing is like i've said before that the the can-am uh maverick sport would have been super cool if it would have just had a more capable bed and a little bit more length and things like that and they come out with the commander and they're like hey all those things you said are, uh, here it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i'm super stoked that maybe possibly in the next couple of weeks i might get my hands on one there you go and be able to take it on the ride in idaho i think that would be uh, it's gonna be awesome heck yeah so uh this episode's definitely gone long enough uh we're super busy super excited to get back out on the road like we have been for the last month um and see everybody at these events we enjoy shaking hands and and meeting people and all that stuff it was super exciting to meet some fans of the show and stuff at the takeover so i can't wait to go to the east coast and see the east coast side of things and experience that um just uh heads up anyone that's interested in going uh, i think hubert roland uh everybody's favorite redneck from nitro circus will be at virginia um so come hang out go ride with him he'll take you out on the trails and have a good time and he's always approachable and things like that so that'll be a lot of fun i'm gonna try to get him on the podcast see what we can't do there cool and uh i think uh it'll be an interesting time uh, a lot of content and stories and talking points to come ahead so uh, looking forward to these announcements coming up looking forward to finally getting some solidity behind some of these rumors and uh if nothing else just to squash some of the rumors and there get them go. out of the talking points but anyways till the next time peace